thank you all for coming tonight. This is our second program uh, with Storm Surge this uh, year. And uh, we've got a couple more in the pipeline. I hope you've all signed in and uh, lent us your email addresses so we can send you notifications of other programs we've got coming up. But I uh, just wanted to let you know that on um, May 13th, we've got uh, Climate Cafe, which is led by our high school students. And we uh, have discussions with adults about climate change and what to do. And really, what comes out of that is to be seen because each one of these events is slightly different depending on how the student uh, leads their particular group. But that's uh, Saturday morning, um, May 13th, at the uh, Senior Center in Newark. Newark. And then following that is a, a program that's going to be fairly interesting on uh, May 24th, which is a Wednesday evening. And uh, part of the the Sandy Grant, which you may have heard about, uh, there, are, there are a number of risk assessments being done for communities around the Great Marsh. And part of uh, the effort there was studying the actual dynamics that are happening along the barrier beaches of Plum Island. So they, the Woods Hole Group did a big study on uh, where does the sand go on Plum Island. And there's been a lot of uh, theory and conjecture about what happens on Plum Island, but I think they've got a pretty good handle on what's actually going on there. And that's going to impact uh, erosion control efforts and beach management efforts. So that's on the 24th. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, we've got a couple of great photo exhibits here. Uh, Gary McPhee with all the birds. Uh, he's from Central Mass on the left. And then our, one of our own uh, storm surge members, Sandy Tilton. She's uh, been recording a lot of the erosion and tracking that on Plum Island, but has also uncovered some really artistic uh, looking uh, views. Uh, and her travels along Plum Island, so you know, check that out when you can. Um, I wanted to introduce Bill Sargent, uh, who was going to introduce our speaker, George Buckley. Uh, I guess these two guys go, go a ways back into their childhood. And uh, so Bill knows George quite a bit better than I do, although we had a great conversation at, uh, at dinner. So if I can find Bill, there he is, <laughs> okay. and uh, Bill will take over. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, yes, we, George and I are, are kind of like twins separated at birth. Um, and first of all, I, it's, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I was in, in the emergency room about an hour ago, uh, and they were dilating my eye. So I, I'm sort of, it's like I'm looking at you through a jellyfish. Um, so you'll, you'll have to imagine first that uh, that I have my original notes rather than these scratches that I was writing down in the, in the uh, emergency room. Uh, and second, that I'm wearing a very fancy white tie with two horseshoe crabs on it. Uh, and those horseshoe crabs, uh, it was a print by Ernst Henkel, uh, who, was a, who was a 19th century biologist and also a very good artist. Uh, he was the guy who came up with the, with the snappy line, Ontolog ontology recapitulates uh, phylogeny. So the next time you, you know, you're in a, uh, uh, you want to have a good elevator pitch, you could try that one. Uh, <laughs> but I met George uh, for the first time at the, at the MCZ, the Museum of Comparative Zoology uh, at Harvard. And um, I, was a, I was a freshman, I think. And when you enter the MCZ, you enter through a basement door, and you sort of go up these stairs, and the stern visage of, uh, of Louis Agassiz looks down at you, and you know, what, you're sort of wondering, am I ever going to be you know, anything like any of these guys? And then you make your way up through, and you go behind a, a, a gorilla that's thumping his chest, and underneath the, the skeleton of a, uh, uh, of, a, of a sperm whale, and then you go up these, uh, you know, um, cast iron great stairs up into the malacology department. And probably most of you know that malacology is the study of the soft parts of clams as opposed to conchology, which is the study of the hard parts of clams. Uh, so I guess George is a conchologist now. Uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, so I, you know, I entered, I entered this room and. And the whole department was in one of their sort of very famous, you know, discussions. And they were discussing how, you know, deodorants were going to lead to the ruination of American sex life, 
or they switched from that to collecting land snails in pre-Castro Cuba. And, uh, and, I, and George was in the corner very caref carefully separating out tunnids and copolithophores and, and uh, all of the mollusks. He was learning the discipline uh, of science. Um, and they offered me, I could do the same thing. But no, I wanted to be at that table telling the stories. Uh, so it sort of continued like that. George went on, got his degree, started his career teaching. Uh, I was mostly trying to avoid organic chemistry and Vietnam. Uh, and, uh, but finally, uh, we, we came together. We started a little uh, a field station uh, down on Pleasant Bay on Cape Cod. And um, uh, it was actually in my parents' house. Uh, my father was in office at the time, so he didn't know what was going on. My older sister knew exactly what was all going on. She said, why have you filled our house with a bunch of hippies and communists? Uh, but anyway, it, you know, it worked out OK. Uh, and then, um, but then, then as we started collecting material, we started looking at horseshoe crabs. Uh, and um, pr probably the, the, you know, the most important discovery to come out of marine biology is the use of horseshoe crab blood in, in, uh, in detecting pyrogens. It's a multi-million dollar uh, industry, and all of the crabs at that time were coming from Pleasant Bay, so it was right in our own backyard. And, um, and George, with his research skills, and me, hopefully, with my writing skills, we were able to sort of finally pick apart uh, what was going on. And we've, we wrote a paper uh, that uh, was sort of the paper that turned around uh, a federal court case uh, about the collecting of, of horseshoe crabs. So we, our, our, our careers have sort of been parallel uh, throughout all of these years. Uh, George is a fantastic teacher. He's a bundle of energy, as, as you, will, you will find out tonight. He's also a very, very good person. Uh, he won a, um, a teaching award at Harvard for, for his teaching, uh, and he also uh, donated his kidney uh, to, his, to his sister, Valerie. Uh, so he's a, he's a very good person, and I'm, I'm honored to, uh, to introduce him tonight. Thank you, Bill. OK, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I wore my horseshoe crab tie in honor of Bill. And uh, this isn't quite a heckle tie, but it's more of one of the, uh, the avant-garde ties they, they have down in Newport or something now. But somebody said they made it for me. So I, uh, I wore that in honor of, of, of Bill and the work that, that we did. And, and those were the halcyon days uh, when naturalists got together. And Bill Clunch had, and Ruth had the best department, I think, at Harvard, because at that table, Bill talked about there was 10 or 15 department heads. And these guys would go at it uh, on everything, including the early days of was continental uh, drift real or not. And, and to watch these guys in the 60s and 70s argue this back and forth and finally decide that it was happening. We didn't have subs, we didn't have satellites, but they had you know, enough information about magnetism and fossils. And, and so uh, Ruth Turner, who we worked with, became the first woman to dive in the submarine Alvin. Uh, named after Albine, who designed her to study the deep sea, and the world's expert on Toritos. You just read about those in the Boston Globe on page two there. They mentioned Ruth Turner at Harvard that was uh, the first person to study those. So, so Bill and I really had a gilded childhood there, uh, going out in the academic Khrushchev in the Belogorsk with the Russians offshore. Didn't mention that because he's sick most of the time. Or flying in a plane with, with no door to try to film Pleasant Bay before the, before, uh, before the days of video and, and drones with a 16 millimeter camera uh, on a gimbal. So the film came out like this and we were doing this. You know, we did it twice in three days. But uh, those, were, those were great days. We did an award winning film on Pleasant Bay, The Sea Behind the Dunes. Bill became an award winning author, of numerous books. And I sort of went on and taught and did field research. And, and I'm coming back now to films. So my most recent film just won the Palme d'Or Award in Marseille. Uh, Bonaire answer about how we preserve uh, coral reefs in the Caribbean. But tonight I want to talk to you about what's going on with the world's oceans. And, and uh, it's almost like what goes on inside our body. We, we don't know until something's wrong, until either a test shows something's wrong or we don't feel good. The oceans are like that. We look at the oceans, they look pretty good, whether it's from space or, or uh, when, we're, when we're standing next to them. Uh, I worked with uh, Frank White at Harvard 
and a number of astronauts now retired, Nicole Stott and Ron Guerin. Uh, and it was Frank who coined the term and wrote the book, The Overview Effect. Uh, what it means to look at Earth from space, what it does to the heart, the soul, and the mind of the people uh, in space, on the moon, in the International Space Station, looking down at Earth. Uh, Cousteau, when he saw the first pictures that came back, uh, said, boy, we're a blue marble in space. And, uh, and so it's been interesting for me to work with those people. I've, I've worked with Cousteau and his son, and now with the grandchildren, Philippe and Alexander, helping to found their organization, Earth Echo, which is carrying on a lot of, carrying on a lot of the work that Bill and I started. Uh, so when we look at the oceans, which cover two-thirds of this great Earth's surface, you think, oh, they're in pretty good shape. They're blue, um, and, and they move around a lot, and there's a fair amount of life there. But it's when we start to go under the surface, scuba diving. I've done darn near 10,000 scuba dives. And when we start to take tests, we start to look over time at what's going on, we realize there's some things that worry us. We're starting to see glaciers break up prematurely. We're starting to see major changes in populations, biodiversity of what's here now versus what was here and what isn't here now that was here. And so uh, that concerns us. And then when we start to see some tiny little changes, people say, geez, we're seeing that the pH has gone down. Our blood is, is about 7.8, oceans are about 8.2 pH, uh, and it's logarithmic. So one tiny small decimal change, one tenth, down to 8.1, can cause a significant change in what's going on in the ocean. So we're worried because global climate change putting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere uh, can have results that aren't just global warming, that just aren't changes in what's going on on the land, but what's going on in the sea. For instance, when we, when we look at uh, things like barnacles, now these aren't our barnacles here, thank heavens, we could not walk on the rocks and we certainly would be worried about our lobster pots and the bottoms of our boats. This is the Azorean barnacle, one of the world's biggest. And barnacles, as you know, if you can close your eyes, nothing more than a shrimp sitting on its head, kicking food into its mouth. Okay, you got that? And then they, they secrete this little shell around themselves. And so they're, a, they're a, uh, an arthropod and a relative of the ocean-going shrimp. So the barnacles of the world start out, as most things in the ocean, as a larvae. And the barnacles, in fact, have a major role in the oceans as food for other things. These are actually food for humans. You go to the Azor Islands, you get steamed barnacles. And, and so what, what we see is that if the larvae are affected, you're not going to see juveniles, you're not going to see adults. And so the barnacle population might undergo significant changes. And certainly for people with lobster pots, people with boats, they're saying, yes, uh, this is good. But in fact, globally, it wouldn't be good. So like the main, anybody know the main lobstermen? They're saying, go global climate change, go, because what have they got? More lobsters, four years old than they ever had before. But well, my friends on Cape Cod and South, they aren't so happy. Their lobster populations are crashing. And so it, we see all kinds of changes. If you look at a sponge, for instance, behold a sponge. One of the interesting things about sponges is they haven't changed much in hundreds of millions of years. And yet they're one of the simplest animals on Earth. They have a little bit of sponge and fiber, sometimes some spicules to give them some form and some uh, safety, and some little cells that, that help to filter out uh, particles in the water when it's pumped in uh, through the pores and they shoot it out. Sponges are extremely simple and very, very susceptible, even though they haven't changed much. And they're abundant over hundreds of millions of years. The fact is, a little bit of change in the water quality could affect sponges. And guess what? All those little holes on the sponges are what? Homes for other life. You go scuba dive with a little light, and you shine that light down on a sponge, and my heavens, is all kinds of things. You find a sponge like this in Pleasant Bay or even here in Plum Island, you take it up and shake it, you'll probably see six or eight crabs, a couple of shrimp, and a, and a couple of little snails fall out. It was sponges that gave rise to the whole concept of geology. It was St. Steno who found seashells in a sponge on a mountaintop. What did that mean? And who was St. Steno? Seashell on a mountaintop is a great little read uh, about this, this uh, monk that, that found this and figured out What's going on here? How can seashells be on a mountaintop? Mountains weren't underwater. 
or were they? And so there's a lot of mysteries that we see in the oceans. Um, if we look at a coral polyp, assume this is a coral polyp. <laughs> this is coral. So if you look at a coral polyp, usually it's open like that, particularly at night. And when coral polyps are open like this, they can feed, they can excrete, they can respire, and most importantly, they can reproduce. But if they're touched by scuba divers, if the silt that comes on them from pollutants, if the water temperature gets too high, or if it gets slightly more acidic, their tender little polyps, the tentacles, will close up. Best use of a dollar toy I ever had. <laughs> and uh, I've gone through hundreds of these poor little things. You have to cut them and take the little ball out. But when they're closed, they look like this. Any scuba divers remember seeing that in the reefs of the Caribbean? So when they're closed, can they feed? No. Can they excrete, get rid of waste? No. Can they respire? Breathe in the vernacular. No. Most importantly, can they reproduce? No. So open, they can do all these things. Closed, they cannot. So when we have effects on the ocean that we don't necessarily see, looking from the spaceship, looking from the plane, looking from the shore, there can be effects going on that grievously affect what's in there. Silt running off from septage, stirred up by boats, temperature increase, and more assiduously increase, decreases in the acidity or increase in acidity, depending how you look at pH. It was Rachel Carson who taught us about the oceans. How many people have read Silent Spring? How many people have read at least one of Rachel's other books? Let it be known that less than 10% of the hands went up. You've got it all backwards. You should start with the sea around us. The sea is all about us. Why? Because those are racial at her very best. As an observer of nature, as a biologist par excellence, it was that, that ability, that skill, those awards she won for that writing that gave the publishers the veritas, the guts to say, we're going to publish Silent Spring. And then Rachel became famous. I met her when I was in high school, and she died shortly thereafter. Uh, she looked terrible, and it turns out she was. She was in the last stages of breast cancer. But then she, people, everybody reads Silent Spring. Read her other books. You will appreciate Rachel Carson a lot more. Peter Matheson uh, was the editor for Courage of Earth about Rachel Carson, where people from E.O. Wilson and others and Matheson all write about Rachel and who she was and what she was and what she meant. Let me pass that around. That's a good primer. But by all means, uh, do read uh, her other books. They're in the library. They're on the internet. She was a spectacular observer of nature and also a writer about what she observed. One of my older students in my master's program rode her around when he was a teenage boy so she could study the tide pools up in Maine. I'd mentioned the corals. And I'll pass one around with a magnifier. Uh, so a coral reef is a group of living organisms. It's not a living organism itself unless you expand the Gaia concept, love locks. Uh, this is one coral of one species, and an individual coral reef the size of this room, or actually the size of this room going all the way down to the center of Newburyport, piece of the Great Barrier Reef, piece of a fringing reef in the Caribbean of the Pacific, is made up of dozens and dozens of different types of corals, and hundreds of each variety, as well as all the other things, the sponges, the invertebrates, and numbers of other creatures. So if you look at one coral and look carefully at it, you see hundreds, thousands of those little polyps, each one with a lot of tentacles. So let me pass that around. Now this coral is made of calcium carbonate, CaCO3, essentially chalk, generic. And as such, it's readily dissolvable if the pH goes down a bit. But even more interesting and more complicated is the fact that coral reefs themselves are held together by things 
like you see on this piece of broken coral. What is the red? Blood of some ocean organism? No. The red is a coralline algae. I once wrote a great little article, my darling Coralina, about <laughs> coralline algae on, on Valentine's Day for the Bon Air Reporter. So this coralline algae is an encrusting algae. Think of if you didn't brush your teeth for a year. <laughs> you could take a wire brush to them, right? That's what this stuff is. It's encrusted, hard algae that helps to glue the reef together. So you don't see this if you went scuba diving next to a coral reef because it's next to the reef. If I could borrow my specimen again, it's down here helping to hold it on. But when there's a storm or a ship hits the reef, you'll be walking the shore and see chunks of this on the shore and think, what the heck is that? It's broken coral with the coralline algae that help hold the corals together. So I'll pass that guy around also. And I have another magnifier. <laughs> so the coral reef then is made up of all these things, and each of them responds slightly differentially to whatever changes there are. Silt, physical damage, change in temperature, change in acidity. So all of these things are affecting the ecology of what's going on on a reef or in a bay, in Plum Island, in Pleasant Bay. Because things are affected differently, you're going to see changes happen differently. And that's why it's so hard for marine biologists, biologists, to predict what's happening and to document what's happening because it's happening differently at different parts of the world. For instance, when we have uh, the water get too warm for a period of time, that can cause coral bleaching, whereby the symbiotic algae that live in concert with the polyps of the coral will either die or be expelled. And so the coral then looks bright white as if it was bleached. It turns out that this whole process is dose-related, just like us. If it's for a short period of time and not too severe, the coral reef will recover, as the Great Barrier Reef started to do after the recent episode. But then they had a second one that was worse and longer. So it's dose-related. High temperature for a short time or high temperature for a low time can have the more severe effects opposed to lower temperature increase. What does that mean? Think of yourselves. What's your temperature? Most of the people in this room are within one or two tenths of a degree of what? 98.6. Okay. How many of you have had a temperature of 101 or 102 and went to work? Maybe felt you shouldn't have, but you, you made it. 103 and 4? Probably not. You were probably in bed. 104 or 5? You were probably like Bill in the ER. 106, 7, 8. How many people have survived a temperature that big without being dunked in a cool bathtub real quick? So we have less than a 10% range of temperature before we're in serious trouble. And yet people think of coral reefs as, oh, they like it hot. No, they don't. They like it warm to cool, lukewarm. Upper 70s, lower 80s is their high point. So once it gets to the mid and upper 80s, coral reefs are in trouble. And if it's upper 80s for a while, the longer the while is, the worse the trouble is, the more of the coral bleaching. And so once that coral head isn't functioning, what about the things that depend on it, either to hide or for food? And so these are some of the things that, that concern us in terms of what's going on. Our friends. The shellfish that Bill mentioned, those of us who study both the shell and the animal, made the shell or malacologists. People who just collect sea shells, they're conchologists. And there's lots of both. So this is Placopectin. This is our scallop, our big scallop offshore. It's a very confounding animal. They don't stay put. How the heck are you supposed to study things that won't stay put? Stay in your seat, we say to kids. Don't run in the street. No. You go out one day and you look at all these scallops. 
You come back the next day, where'd they go? Maybe somebody collected them. Maybe they got up and moved. Maybe they didn't like it where they were. And if we get more acidic oceans, the larvae, the baby scallops, will suffer. They may not live to become an adolescent. If they do, they may be damaged. They may not have as thick a shell or may not grow a shell as quickly. Think of how you grow a fingernail. You bang that fingernail with a hammer, it's going to come back pretty, pretty, pretty crooked, pretty crappy. If a, the mantle, the thin tissue that secretes the shell is damaged, you'll have a damaged shell. And so a seashell, a mollusk, whether it be a clam or a snail or whatever, is made of calcium and carbonate put together in little brick-like crystals. Think of a brick wall. And then held together, just like the brick wall, by snail glue. It's a generic term. It's called conchial. Look up conchial, C-O-N-C-H-I-L-L. So this holds the crystals of the shell together. If you have an increase in acidity, that's not going to be as solid as it should or could be. And so these are some of the things we've seen in the lab that we can predict what's happening in the ocean. So there's a lot of studies going on at colleges and labs around the world right now about the effects of ocean acidity. MIT has been one of the, one of the leaders of a landlocked college. And interestingly, these little guys are part of an interesting story here in New England where both the state and the federal government both got it wrong about scallops. How could both get it wrong about scallops? Well, it's like if you walk into a classroom at the wrong time, there's going to be nobody there. And you could rightfully say, nothing's happening in that classroom. If you come back other times, it's like this room. Oh, my heavens, it's full. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And so it's called dipsticking. We go out, and we do a sample here, because there used to be scallops there. And we do a sample here and here. We come back and say, Jesus, scallops are way down. And we do that a couple of times. The feds do it. The state people do it. Are we out there all the time? No. Have we yet got underwater drones that can stay there in one place looking afar away? No. It's hard to see underwater. It's darker. It's not as clear as we'd like it to be because it was clear to be no life. So the scallop fishermen were saying, wait, there's a lot of scallops out there. The scuba divers were saying, there's lots of scallops out there. Who here scuba dives? Excellent. You've scuba off for scallops. Oh my God, are they great. This big, dinner plates. So not the little base golf, that's a sweet little tasty guy, but these guys are good. So the fisherman, one of my students was involved in this, uh, took students out that developed a little camera system, GoPros are great, put them on a string, put them down, wire them up, they'll take great pictures. And the feds say, said, well, you can't prove how big they are or where they are, all right? So they figured out a better way to track that. They said, no. You can't tell what size it is. So you figured out a way with little lasers to figure out how big they were. They said, well, that's just the one area. So it took three years. Meanwhile, the fishermen had taken these kids out whenever they wanted to go for free. Help us out here. Finally, the feds in the state said, you're right. And so now, Placopectin magellanicus, the ocean scallop, is one of the richest fisheries in New England, particularly in New Bedford as we speak. So we need better data gathering, both from chip and from satellite, but that takes a lot of money. Most of that money comes from the federal government, through the Office of Naval Research, uh, the Bill and I used to work with, with NOAA, we both worked with the Ocean, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And both of those agencies are faced with severe budget cuts. Most of our oceanographic institutions are down a ship. Did you ever go to Woods Hole? You saw our fleet. There is no Oceanus anymore. Oceanus was not replaced. Nor our big giant research vessel uh, that discovered Titanic and things. It was getting older. We gave it to another institution and we got a new vessel, the Armstrong. Nice vessel. Not as big, not as wide. Not as many days at seas. Doesn't carry as many scientists, but thank you, we got it. So this is what's happening to us. The Russians are building icebreakers. Why? Because they realize the, the poles are breaking up. And we need ice-hardened ships to be able to go there, not only just to do research, but to do rescue, to operate under solar, safety of life at sea. And they're building icebreakers. We're not. 
And so there's a lot of issues that are not related to politics, whatever politics might be. It's related to doing science. We have a long history of doing science well. And uh, I worked just before I retired with Bill Ruckelshaus, who was probably one of the best directors of the Environmental Protection Agency ever. Who appointed him to that? Nixon. Richard Nixon, who not only allowed EPA to be formed, but well-funded it, Richard Nixon. Who was, what party was he in, by the way? <laughs> yeah, so this, this isn't Republican, Democrat. This is a matter of doing the right thing. Uh, so it's, it's interesting where we're going. When we look for information, sometimes we have to go back to the fossils. What can we learn from a fossil? They've been dead for millions of years. These two here come from the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, and they're about 250 to 350 million years old. I have to say about, because A, I didn't collect them, and B, I don't know what level they came from, and C, I didn't destroy one to figure out how old it was. So when we want to figure out how old something is, we have to know when it was collected, how it was collected, where it was collected, and then take a sample and destroy it. So when we find others that come from that general area, we can say they're about that many million years old. If we want to say with more certainty, not exactly the day or the year, but within a range of five or 10 million, we have to destroy it to do, to do tests on it. So we can readily tell, well, they're from that area, so they're about that old. And so the Atlas Mountains of Morocco have phosphate mines. And the people who dug the phosphate out by hand would find a fossil now and then, a cruddy old fossil. And they'd bring it home. And a couple of tourists would show up and say, I'll give you some money for that. So over time, they figured out, hmm, these things are worth some money. So the art, the craft, and the science of fossil hunting in the Atlas Mountains and the phosphate mines has now become a major industry. Went out of the third generation of doing this. And we're getting fossils that we never saw before. We're getting fossils that <clears throat> museums didn't have until recently. We're getting fossils that used to sell for ten and twenty thousand dollars that you can buy for ten and twenty and thirty dollars. Because this has become a huge industry over there. And science has benefited because we're getting all these fossils. So you fly through Reagan National Airport, um, the Smithsonian has a shop there. And they sell all our extra fossils there at that shop. And so the TSA people always say, what do you got now when I'm coming back? When I lecture, they usually give me one and I'll buy more as gifts at the shop there. And so uh, here we have an ammonite. And here we have a relative of the ammonite and the squid uh, off of Ceres, which hasn't curled up yet. You'll see all the segments just like a, uh, a nautilus. So these mollusks that Bill and I talk about include not only the snails and the clams, but but uh, sea slugs, and land slugs, nudibranchs, but also things like the octopus, the squid, uh, and, and, uh, and those type of creatures. So it's, a, it's an interesting phylum uh, that's been around for hundreds of millions of years. And so those of us that study it take great joy in terms of learning about these things. We figured out the anatomy pretty well. But now we're working uh, more so uh, on, the, uh, on the ecology. And at the end of the meeting, if somebody would like, uh, I've got some little vials of intertidal beach drift. This is from a project Philippe Cousteau worked on and dozens of other people with us, where we'd collect what was intertidal. Intertidally here, you pick up some sand. Intertidally on bays and islands in the Caribbean, that intertidal sand has representative pieces of what was on the coral reef. So by collecting that, and looking at it under a microscope and identifying what's in it, we can get an idea of what's going on year by year by year. So I brought some little samples of those in a vial that my Valerie put together, uh, along with some, some uh, labels. She was coming, but she, like Bill, ended up at the hospital today and, and needed a tooth extracted, so wasn't able to join us. So those are there. There's also a couple of pieces of a broken coral. So if you'd like to take one home to look at, um, those are there. I may need some help with this. Uh, maybe you can help me pass these out. I'll pass these. I'll start some up here. Here, okay. And then maybe you can pass some out up here. There you go. So I made up a little poop sheet here about oceans of opportunities. Before I go on and talk about this wonderful thing on the screen that we've advertised, um, 
I talk in this about an ocean of opportunities and mention that this awaits a regional ocean uh, of ocean opportunities in this region here. Uh, there's lots of groups like this that offer all kinds of programs. Last Wednesday, our uh, pre-Earth pre Week program, I was down at the Cohasset Coastal Science Center, which runs programs for students. Um, but the New England Aquarium in Boston, the first organization to put a building up on that old, old waterfront uh, with the help of Frank Sargent and, and Roger Stone and uh, uh, Mrs. Spaulding, Helen Spaulding, and Mayo White, uh, they've all passed on. But their fingerprints are all over that place because they said, you know, rather than having a few tanks in the basement of a building in Boston, we ought to have a proper aquarium on the water. We said, that's dangerous. We haven't got the money. We said, don't worry, we'll, we'll work on that. So there we are today. And uh, we become one of the top research aquariums in the entire world, uh, one of the top education aquariums in the world. What makes us that is you walk through that aquarium, we have more doses, more volunteers, more, more labels, more instruction of what's going on in the tanks than any place else. And we have a phenomenal variety of specimens. We also have all kinds of opportunities for, for kids and adults as volunteers, as interns, and additionally, uh, we run programs like this almost every week. There's some kind of a free program going on. We were offering a, a lecture or a film uh, that's, that's happening. So NEAQ.org will help you with that. And if you have kids that are interested in summer programs, they have a great variety of summer programs. And now uh, I was just helping out with a program. We do Sundays where kids will come in for the whole day Sunday for six weeks and learn about the oceans as, as part of a, a class for high school students. The Boston Sea Rovers meets annually up here in Danvers um, at the, uh, uh, used to be the Ferncroft, it's now a double tree, I think. But they've got free parking, the rooms are 150 bucks a night if you stay there. They've got all kinds of workshop rooms that we use. And so we bring 1,000, 2,000 people together one of the early weekends in March for an ocean conference. And the Friday before, a bunch of those people come in uh, to Boston, to the Boston Public Library. We do a program just for high school and middle school kids about the oceans. And so that's Boston Sea Rovers. We also have a special uh, summer internship uh, for a high school senior or college freshman. So we're advertising now for the fall so people can think of, of submitting then. They need to be a scuba diver. Uh, we've selected this summers already, but this is a great program for kids to spend the summer working with sea rovers around the world uh, doing all kinds of programs and becoming a, an advanced diver in the process. HUI, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Falmouth, uh, is a phenomenal organization that does global marine research. They have a spectacular local little visitor center on School Street with a mock-up of Alvin. They also have a wonderful uh, online presence and a journal. And so that's at hui.edu. And you can join the aquarium as a member, have special benefits, and you can join uh, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution as an associate and get invited down there to some special uh, benefits. And those of our people in the New York area were bringing the new research vessel, the Neil Armstrong, up to New York for Fleet Week. That's a little bit of a risky situation, I think. I don't know if we get our crew back. But people are going to be invited on board uh, for open house for that. The Boston Malacological Club, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Um, meets at Harvard. And it's a seashell group. We're only 107 years old. We're sort of young compared to some other groups. And uh, at 7.30 and each Tuesday evening, the first Tuesday each month, October through May, we have a great meeting about seashells. Some of them are about deep sea mollusks. Some of them may be about land snails. Some may be about freshwater clams. We have artists. We have professors. We have young people. We have older people. It's a fun group. Uh, and and uh, next Tuesday night, my voice comes back. I am their auctioneer for their fundraising auction for their scholarships and education programs where people bring in all their extra books about the oceans, seashells, art, craft, and everything else, including every other year a seashell-shaped hamburger press, which is fun <laughs> to have that come up every other year. I think they do it purposely. But anyway, if you're interested in information about that, you can email me. My email's at the bottom. And then the Harvard University Extension School, where I helped start their environmental sciences master's program some 20 years ago now, an hour, 
I had one student, Lindy Von Mutis from Ghana, and I have 300 from 50 states and 50 countries because uh, we started online education at Harvard. I was one of the first four people at Harvard to teach a course online. I'm now a living dinosaur, from pioneer to dinosaur, uh, all in a decade and a half. But uh, we've got almost 1,000 courses in different fields, from astronomy and anthropology all the way through sustainability and environmental sciences, my group. So if you go on extension.harvard.edu, click through the courses, uh, it's phenomenal. The neat thing is now, from that humble start, out of our almost 1,000 courses during the whole year, over 800 are online as well as live. And so all you need is a computer at home. You can be here in your, your fluffy uh, uh, socks and robe or your shorts and, and the snowstorm and watch these courses. Or come on up to Harvard, because most of them are online as well as live. And uh, when I first started that, I thought, boy, I'm going to get a kid from Cape Cod a scholarship to this. So I, I got the kid from Orleans, so Seth Tringali, a scholarship. And guess what? The pipe ended in Hyannis. Where was he? Orleans. So having got him the scholarship, I didn't need to drive down or send down the tapes and CDs every week. But now it extends all the way down. So there's a lot going on that you people can become part of beyond supporting this wonderful group here. And uh, I left my, my email down there if you're interested. I think everybody got one? Great. Yes. So thank you for all you people that helped pass these, uh, these around. So now I want to introduce the star of the night, coccolithophore. You all know what diatoms are, those little things that live in the ocean or have lived in the ocean for millions of years, and we find all kinds of deep uh, piles of them in the bottom of the ocean. You know what foraminiferans are? Some of you heard that term, radiolarians. So radiolarians, foraminifera, diatoms make up some of the layers, the ooze on the bottom of the ocean. Collectively, they and other dead microscopic things in the ocean make up marine snow. If you went down in the submarine Alvin, taking a few hours to get from the top to the bottom, it's not like dropping a rock, um, you think, geez, it's snowing or raining. What's that outside the little tiny port? That's marine snow. That's all the things that were living in the top you know, 100 meters of the ocean that have died and now floating slowly down to the bottom. Well, one of the overlooked members of that group are the coccoliths. And the coccolithophore is a single one. Collectively, they clump together to look like a little tiny soccer ball. Well, it's interesting. With the oceans getting warmer and the oceans getting more acidic and there being trillions of these things, the biogeochemical cycles, giant word essentially means what happens to the chemistry of the ocean when there's a change. The ocean is made up of all these complex cycles. And so these little things seem to have a very critical role in what's going on in the oceans. But we don't fully understand it yet, nor do we understand what's going to happen as the oceans change, which they are doing and will do. So it's a matter of how much change over how long a time. And can we make some of it less worse. So I wanted to introduce this term because how many people have heard this term before? Great. You're going to hear a lot more about it. It's going to be on 60 Minutes. It's going to be on the Boston Globe. It's going to be on most uh, magazines that have any level of truth or, or fact uh, because it's an issue of concern that's growing, as is ocean acidification. So the coccolithophores are really neat little things. But, as I said, we think we know something about them, but every time we think we know something about them, somebody else does research that says, well, maybe that's not quite what's going on. And so it could well be that in different parts of the world's oceans, coccolithophores are responding to conditions there that are slightly different con to conditions somewhere else. And therefore, what we see going on is, in fact, what's going on there, but not there. And so they're one-cell marine plants that live in the upper layers of the ocean, just like the foraminifera, the diatoms, and the radiolarians. And like those, they grow and die and then fall in that marine snow process to the bottom. And so they're unicellular, eukaryotic, phytoplankton, which means they're not a zooplankton, not an animal. 
And are they the answer to climate change or are they going to make it worse in the oceans? So let's spend a few minutes. We've got a few minutes. Uh, and uh, see what's going on with these little guys. I don't have samples. They're too small. So populated forests prefer mild water temperatures, so like New England. Water that's not nutrient rich, nutrient poor, and subpolar regions. Near. So most phytoplankton, on the other hand, prefer cool water, diatoms, foraminiferidal area, areas with nutrient upwelling, like George's Bank, and it, they live everywhere else. So it's interesting this dissonance. So these are interesting. These are the oddball kids. And so if you look with an electron microphotograph at these things, boy, don't they look fun. Wow. Any artists here? Painters? Getting some ideas here? Google Cockalithophor and go for it. Um, any designers? I can see these as great ball things that you can bounce around. So, so hopefully we give some people a chance to get their, their arts, their crafts hooked with their science. And, uh, and here's a small one that's, uh, you can see when they break apart what happens. And so they will glue themselves together like this. We're not exactly sure how they glue themselves together or stick themselves together or hold themselves together. Three different things. And here we see what happens when a whole bunch of them break down. So when you look under the microscope and see this, say, wait a minute, is this them breaking down or are these young ones that are growing up that are going to stick together? And this is the process of them starting to come together. And what is the optimum size? What is the maximum number of these that will stick together before they, they start to fall apart or fall to the bottom? So what we see here is the diversity of size and shape and the individual little ones. And we don't know if they've broken off or they're in the process of growing to stick on. What are these? Anybody go overseas? Fought in the Great World War? Yes, the White Cliffs of Dover. If you go out and just dig your fingernails through those white cliffs and come back, <coughs> scrape out what's under it, put on a microscope slide, you're going to see most of the things I mentioned. Coccolithophores, diatoms, straminiferins, probably some radiolarians. And so the White Cliffs of Dover, how'd they get there? Conveyor belt? Somebody did a lot of digging? No. <clears throat> they, like the mountains where St. Steno, seashell on a mountain at the top, found a spongy old a fossil sponge with a little snail in it. These were underwater. And when you look at this great earth of ours, uh, a lot of it was underwater. If you take a, one of those old National Geographic maps the kids have pretty much torn apart, take it out and cut all the continents out, stick them back together, and it's gone to Wanaland or Pangaea. You'll see how Africa fits almost perfectly in between North and South America. You can stick Madagascar sort of up where it belongs. Uh, <laughs> geez. <laughs> what do we do with India? We ram India right up <laughs> into the backside of, of Eurasia. And what do we create? A mountain range. And so it's pretty neat. And then you look at the west coast of the US to see, oh, all these mountains and things. Look at the west coast. From South America, what do you see? All these mountains and things. Well, why is that? Remember I said the continents were drifting? Let's go on a magical, put our VR goggles on, we're down now in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, as Bob Ballard did with uh, Inframarin and, and uh, Shiroff from France, 1970s, on the French-American mid-ocean study, Project Famous. And they're tooling along in submarines. What the hell is that? It was a mountain range right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, a big one. Well, they're looking at this. They didn't have time or money or days to run that submarine, a couple of thousand miles. But they did go back with the work that Marie Tharp and Heason had done and figured out this is mid-Atlantic ridge that goes right down the middle of the Atlantic. Then when they had time and money, they went back they found out that there's some volcanism along that. And it turns out the youngest Earth 
is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean where that mid-Atlantic ridge is constantly spreading out and pushing. <coughs> so North and South America and Africa and Europe are being pushed gently apart, centimeter, two or three years. What's happening on the other side over here? A little pressure here, guys? So yes, the Pacific plate is sort of getting squeezed a bit. And so what happens? Mountain ranges. We call the Pacific the ring of fire. Earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis, mountains. Because that's what's happening. I've just, I've just taken how many hundreds of millions of years and <laughs> put them together in, in eight seconds. Um, but yeah. So who thought that theory up? And when? Wagner. Wagner. About 1938. Oops, oh, he, Christ, he's wrong. That German guy, he's just he's drinking too much beer. And over 10, 20, 30, 40 years, people say, oh, wait, there's lines of magnetism like this. There's fossils there, and there's fossils there that are very much alike. So people start to think, geez, maybe, maybe he wasn't so wrong. Once we had submarines that went down and looked, once we had satellites that could only see but measure the spreading, yeah, he was right. How do we lose these dinosaurs? How long did it take us to figure that out? The Alvarez's, father and son, good, good paleontologists and geologists. They were looking at fossils, those Framaniferans I mentioned, and these radiolaria and those things, diatoms. And they said, wait a minute, there's been a change in the fossils. What's going on? Then they said, wait, what's that? It's a layer of iridium. Where does the iridium come from? Meteorites. So they were able to deduce that it was probably a big meteorite that hit Earth that caused major, major changes. Did we believe that? Of course not. So it takes us a while, doesn't it, Mr. Gore, thank you, to get things into the vernacular. So people say, you know, maybe that is what's going on, you know, possibly, just maybe. And so now, of course, that's what happened. But it takes us a long while to validate our beliefs, but even longer to change our beliefs. A dear friend of mine damn near cost himself tenure at Harvard, Phil Saddle, because he had audacity to go up to Harvard's freshman as they're uh, seniors, I'm sorry, as they're coming out with their degrees, hot in hand, on that warm day in June, back now it's May, um, and say, do you know why the sky is blue? Do you know what makes the rainbow? Do you know the colors of the rainbow? Why is the sea blue? Oh, my heavens. And it wasn't good. And we said, that's it, Phil, we'll never make tenure. But we got a few grants, we started Project Star, and we got tenure. We survived. Um, so it's interesting with science about what science is and how we do science. Today, with the internet, we can have chalk talk to the world. With the internet, we can have this conversation, not only with other scientists around the world, but with other people around the world. So I know everybody complains about kids and the internet, and kids and YouTube, and kids and podcasts, but if we corral that angst, if we corral that technological skill, as I clearly have at Harvard, um, wow, what you can do. <coughs> 350 students from around the world, from 50 countries and 50 states. Did I ever think I'd have that? No. If I had a class this big, this was huge. Huge. So we're making progress, but we've got we've to have a meeting of the minds to say, wow, that's neat. Can you have your kids that are doing projects here in Parker River? Wildlife refuse. Put them on as YouTube videos, at podcasts, use the local cable TV. Get these kids engaged here. Get them active. There's all kinds of possibilities for what we can do using technology. And, and uh, it's not easy all the time. But So anyway, what about these things that we find in the White Cliffs of Dover, that we find in the bottom of the sea, that we use really, really microfine uh, little tiny sieves we can get? They're covered by microscopic plating made of limestone. We saw that, the little thing stuck together. That's calcite. It's a single organism surrounded by at least 30 of these little scales. These scales, known as coccoliths, are shaped like cubcaps. We've seen that. 
And so the coccolithophores then are the spherical shell cells about 5 to 10 micrometers, tiny, enclosed by these calcareous plates called coccolis, which are about 2 to 25 micrometers. So we estimate that these dump about 1.5 million tons, 1.5 billion kilograms of calcite a year, making the leading calcite producers in the ocean. What the hell does that mean? Well, if the oceans are changing and that goes up or down, this could be interesting. This could be part of that giant biogeochemical cycle issue that I mentioned. And I could fill this room with 100 people, all of us say, yeah, I, I study coccolithophores. And we'd probably have three groups. Some of them all said, we don't know. Some of them said, well, I think it's going this way. Some of them said, I think it's going that way. And so this is a field that's hot and changing. And so you can see here, I'm sorry, this is a lot of focus, looking at the, the chloroplast, which is the functional aspect that does the photosynthesis up in the shallows, the unfinished coccolith that's still growing, uh, and then the nucleus, the center, and then the mitochondria, the, the energy uh, center of this thing. So it's structured much like the standard cell we studied in middle school, high school, undergraduate school, whatever. So here's another electron microphotograph. These are fantastic. Uh, and uh, use a ton of energy. They're expensive, these machines. But, but boy, you have to make sure they're on the ground. It's very quiet when uh, trucks going by. So you get an idea what the outside structure of this is. So the bigger question is why? Why this structure? Why this pattern? Why this complexity? We don't know. Um, it may well be that this is important for reflectivity. So they can reflect light. But why do you want to reflect light if you're a plant like you want to absorb light? So what they lack in size, they make up in volume. They multiply asexually, die, or simply make too many scales and then plummet to the bottom. So what controls the making of the scales? We don't know. What decides what the optimum number is of scales? Do a, a little uh, uh, diagram of that. In areas with trillions of these, the waters will turn an op opaque turquoise from the dense cloud. Let me show you one of these that was taken in the southern hemisphere. Look at that. Satellites are fantastic. And another problem we're facing is reducing the number of satellites, partly because they might be involved in studying this darn stuff called global climate change. If we don't have evidence, we can't make claims, can we? You all remember in college, your professor saying, you make a claim, you have to show evidence. Claim evidence, claim evidence. Remember writing CE or anybody instructor, you write CE, CE, CE all over paper and write. Um, we collect a phenomenal amount of data every single second and minute of every single day from our satellites, which give us much better understanding of what's going on, just not meteorologically, but in terms of the whole planet Earth and then using GIS, geographical information systems, we'll have one satellite stuck above a certain place on Earth that moves <coughs> with the Earth. We can really focus in on that. Whether we're a town planner, or a disaster planner, a highway planner, uh, in agriculture, whatever you, whatever you want. Uh, so it's phenomenally important to keep all those satellites up. We can't rely entirely on citizen science about Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and and a few others say, I know we'll launch our own satellite for you. Uh, that may help here or help there, but we as a society have to kick in on that. So here's another sort of a disarticulated uh, coccolithophore showing the structure as they get more and more complex. And sometimes we'll have a couple of layers of these making that up. I'm sorry, when, I, when we rescan these, the, uh, the image looks OK on the screen, but not when it's projected. So what is their role ultimately in the in the ecosystem as we know the ecosystem, these biogeochemical cycles of the world's oceans. They're not normally harmful to other marine life. They don't eat them. Uh, they don't absorb them. In nutrient-poor conditions, they are allowed to exist where other phytoplankton cannot. So this would seem to be an advantage, because that means other things might be able to feed on them, filter feed us, go going through the water, sucking things in. Uh, smaller fish as old plankton eat normal phytoplankton will also feast on these. So in areas where there aren't a lot of nutrients, not a lot of, a lot of other life, this can allow other things to come in. Is that good or is that bad? What does Kurosawa think? 
Karmabi at the Marine Science Center. We don't know. Overall, their ability to live in nutrient poor condition allows them to thrive and fill in gaps in the ocean food chain. So this appears to be good. So that means if there was a collapse of these, this would be bad for the ocean ecosystem at large. Here's the formula about these in climate. Calcium carbonate and forms together, uh, and, and then you have this uh, coming together and breaking down. You end up with calcium carbonate, CO2, and H2O uh, as a result. Simple chemistry. But when we start to decrease the, uh, uh, increase the acidity, decrease the pH, uh, we can end up with, with issues. So here we take the formula again, and we show you what happens. Um, they're taking in uh, uh, CO2, taking in uh, and calcium carbonate, making this copper lithophore. This becomes a sinking flux of, of chemistry changing back and forth. But as they get too heavy or die, uh, and we don't know really what causes death yet, we know that higher temperature and we know that increase in acidity, drop in pH, will cause death. Uh, but we're unsure how much over how long. And then that starts them to sink. As they sink, this creates a flux where they start to break down. And what does this add or subtract from the ocean biogeochemistry as this happens? And what would happen if there was a major death where trillions of them went to the bottom all at the same time? We're not sure. So in the short term, the effects are very complex and difficult to determine. Yeah, I've already said that. Um, so that's why I say you're going to hear a lot about these because these are becoming one of the organisms de jour. We say, wait a minute, they're there in trillions of numbers, and we really don't understand exactly what's going on with them, and we should. And so the rise in ocean acidification may affect the calcification machinery of these, and where some CO2 is released in coccolith formation, the concern is that higher temperatures and upper layers of the ocean may become more temperate, more stagnant, and this could result in population of coccolis going way up and therefore increasing CHG greenhouse gas emissions. Interesting. Interesting. We talk about everything but coccolithophores. We talk about cows. We talk about people. We talk about everything but not coccolithophores. And so that's why I'm telling you, you're going to hear more and more and more about these wonderful tiny little plants long term. Uh, we're looking at an organism that's photosynthetic that ideally takes CO2 in but also has some release. The production of these requires the uptake of dissolved inorganic carbon and calcium, and calcium carbonate and CO2 are produced from calcium and bicarbonate. And interestingly, as I showed you with the coral and with the shells, they depend on similar chemicals. So if these start to uptake a lot, is that going to affect that? Or if they all die, is that going to be positive even though they release CO2? And all these other things will have all this calcium and carbonate to deal with. We're not sure. And so when a molecule, molecule of a coccolith is made, one less carbon atom is allowed to roam freely in the world to form greenhouse gas, green gases and contribute to global warming. So this is positive. 320 pounds of carbon going to every ton of coccolith produced if you're interested in numbers. That's a, that's, a, that's a stretch, but it's what has been calculated in a high albedo of uh, concentration these could reflect more sunlight. Is that good or is that bad? It depends. And so here we take a, a, a 3D look at one of these beautiful things. And again, my art and, uh, and, and uh, sports and other people out there, sculpture people can go, go nuts with these. We're recording this so it'll be on TV. Uh, and, and I look forward to coming to some shows and seeing these things in, in some iteration. Uh, in, in outside the strict field of, of marine sciences. Um, and so there are sources. Uh, uh, you, can, you can Google these sources and, and, uh, and you know, make your own determinations and continue your own studies. So anyway, I want to thank you all. And uh, we, we started with, with hands-on and ended with some complex stuff. But uh, this is a word you'll be seeing and hearing more and more and more about. I wanted to help bring it to you so you had some understanding of what's going on and say, well, it's complex. And we always try to hope things are simple. We want a, a simple answer, yes or no. It isn't always that way. My dear pal Dan Ray will, will when he doesn't like a guest about something, say, well, is it this or that? No, it's neither. And, and, uh, but anyway, uh, thank you.
questions? I'd like to give you some, an opportunity to um, ask some questions of George. And following the uh, question and answers, there's a, a book of Bill Sargent's that we're raffling off. So uh, let's go with the questions first. And, then we'll and don't forget before you leave, if you'd like a little sample of these coral things, I don't know exactly what's in each one. There's those plus labels, plus some, uh, here I'll put them up here, uh, plus some little individual coral pieces that we were studying that we don't need anymore. And if people have some of those specimens, if they get them back up front, I need them for my next lecture next week that I do on the road. Questions? Yes? Acid rain is a big problem for our lakes and rivers. And uh, most of it's caused, I guess, by sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide. I was just wondering, uh, it has to probably have some effect on the acidification of the ocean. In particular, that happens with its runoff. You know, every source of water on Earth that's not salt, sooner or later, runs into salt, the drainage. And so when that happens, you'll see like in the northwest Gulf of Mexico, um, I think it's Tallahassee area, you see extreme acidification in a couple of areas caused by just what you're talking about. An extension of that with my mollusks is the freshwater clams are now horrendously threatened uh, in the U.S. because of just that and because of habitat destruction, probably 50-50. All of our buttons used to be made from freshwater clams. Almost none of them are now. They're made of plastic, which means we use, we use uh, oil. Of interest, China uh, helped to clean up the Charles River Delta, pot partly to a project one of my students, uh, Gerald Chan, and not Gerald, I'm sorry, Larry. Uh, and they are now producing billions <laughs> of freshwater clams a year from which they're making freshwater uh, pearls by inserting a little piece of something under there. So you see all these inexpensive, decent looking, not perfect pearls that are admittedly bleached because they're usually in any color but pure white. Those are almost all from the Pearl River Delta of China. All those nice little freshwater pearls you see. And you get a nice strand for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 bucks rather than 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars. Those are from the freshwater clams there. Whereas our populations, we used to have we, we have some of the best freshwater drainage in the entire world uh, between uh, Ohio down and, and the Mississippi River, Mason-Dixie line down in Mississippi. And most of the freshwater uh, clams and snails out of that area are either extinct or threatened. Excellent question. Yes? Uh, is it uh, possible to grow these uh, papalithophores like in tanks and then subject them to uh, tests? Yes, and that's, that's being done just like we're doing uh, with the corals, the clams, the snails, and the barnacles right now. Coccolists are a little bit behind that because they're so small and hard to, to, do, to work on. So uh, MIT's done a lot on mollusks. Other people have done corals on, on what happens with acidity, but the uh, coccolists are right behind. Would you like to help us fund that? <laughs> I think I <laughs> we learn. Always ask. Yes. In the, in the last slide, um, they almost look uh, transparent. OK, let me go back. Well, don't forget, this is an enhanced slide. This, this, is, not, this is not exactly from nature. This is a, 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 a digitally, photographically enhanced slide to help show the innards. But it, it is digitally and photographically enhanced. So it, it's not quite as real. But you, 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 can, you can see through them, but usually not because of the layers. Can you recommend any uh, recent uh, uh, documentaries on ocean acidification? Oh, dropping acid. <laughs> uh, and I have a program I'm putting together about ocean acidification, and I entitled it Dropping Acid. One of my teaching assistants said, um, <laughs> I don't no. think so. They're going to think you've got Tim Leary up there in front of the class. <laughs> you, he's not. And so I said, OK. But Dropping Acid is one of the titles of one of the documentaries. And I forget who did it, but Google Dropping Acid, and I think you'll, you'll find it. There's, there's several on their way out if they're not out already. And like I said, I've got a new program coming out soon like this. Yes? So that's a single organism. Organism. That, no, that's the single one cell. Yes. Plankton, yes. Surrounding itself with these hubcaps. Exactly. That have calcium carbonate. Exactly. 
Exactly. And it uses CO2 to form these hubcaps? Yes. And when it dies, oh. some CO2 oh. is released? Yes. But most of the CO2 goes to the bottom of the ocean with it? With them. So the theory you are propounding is that it's good for global warming for these to produce and take CO, take carbon to the bottom of the Yes, ocean. where something that then might eat it and recycle it there. Yep, good, good synopsis. At least that's the, one of the theories right now. They always says, wait a minute, if they all start dying near the surface, then we could be in trouble. So uh, ocean acidification, what are the impacts for New England fisheries in terms of horseshoe crabs, shellfish, lobsters? Those are all big, big industries. Number one fishery in New England, Plankopectin magellanicus, multi-million dollar industry, largely to bed fit. Uh, tens of millions, so Google... Uh, scallop fishery in New England. Uh, those and then all the plankton that they depend on. Keep in mind their filter feeders. They're sucking things in. We worry more about the whole ecosystem, what that might do, and that would affect mussels, depending on what mussels are filtering. That would affect all the, all the fish start as a larvae. They start as a little tiny baby fish. And if it's slightly acidic, that larvae is not going to grow well. It hasn't got its protective scales yet. It hasn't got its protective mucus yet. And of those that are adult that do have their protective mucus, acid, uh, even a slight drop in, in, in the pH of the ocean, slight increase in the acid is going to affect that mucus, which then can affect that fish, uh, fish's ability uh, to withstand virus, fungi, bacteria, a small bite or scratch, what have you. Just like our skin, we have an epidermis that protects us. The younger you are, the more protective that epidermis is. The older you get, the, the tougher your skin gets, the, the thinner it gets, the, the less protection you have. You certainly know that because we've been doing gardening this last couple of weeks with horns and prickles and those things. Yes, sir? Um, I heard scallops have a short lifespan. Well, it depends. The base scallop, um, pectin irradiance, a little beautiful blue-eyed guy, uh, is a biologist's nightmare and an absolute super nightmare for anybody involved in shellfish management because it reproduces and then dies. And the young one grows, reproduces, and dies, usually within two years. Less than 1% make it to three. And so how the heck do you manage these things? And what do they do? Move around. There's been times where we're, ready, we're pushing to open the fishery in, in uh, Orleans and oh my God, they're over in Chatham. Don't open it yet. Wait till they come back. Uh, but they are sweet. They are wonderful. But my God, you can't depend on them because you'll have a phenomenal crop one year and then next year it crashes. We don't know exactly why. And so it's very careful not to open the season until most of them have reproduced. Because once they reproduce, they start fattening up that eye, that muscle. And if you take too many before they've reproduced, you just croaked yourself for the next year. So that's horrendous. This guy here, and this is a young one, um, this, this plecopectin, this is the ocean scallop. Uh, this is the one they fish with dredges offshore. Uh, these, these can live for years. And uh, Kevin Stokesbury down at UMass Dartmouth is one of the experts on these. Uh, and uh, Dick Bailey at Northeastern is one of the experts on the history of these, the fossil history of these. Good question. Yes? You uh, mentioned uh, mussels. <clears throat> I've heard uh, anecdotal comments or read anecdotal comments about a reduction in mussels observed here in the Northeast. Um, I personally haven't seen that. I'm just kind of curious, on your perspective, is there, in fact, a notable reduction in mussels in the shore, along the shoreline? It, it varies all over the lot. Yeah. Um, it's gone down in some areas, and you have places like Pleasant Bay on the Cape, Orleans, Chatham, uh, Harwich. Uh, when we had the Barry Beach break, cold ocean salt water come in, my God, we've got phenomenal mussels. So we used to have a small few. So it varies. Mussels like it cold and salty. They don't like it warm, and they don't like it estuarine. So those are two factors that can affect the mussels. And, of course, mussels uh, can filter you know, 10, 20 gallons of seawater a day. They're almost like oysters. We're out in the cleanup Wallfleet Harbor with oysters. And they bioprocess that stuff fairly quickly, help to clean up the water. Good question. Anybody else? Yes? As the Arctic tundra is melting 
and the permafrost is starting to disappear, there's concerns that there'll be massive uh, amounts of methane gas released. Exactly. And what effects will that have? Because that's one I've heard is more scary than anything, anything else, because it's one of the top greenhouse gases. And our dear old friend, Carl Sagan, um, after the Wagner's theory got moderately accepted, uh, created the term nuclear winter. Uh, and he was doing that representing what might happen if we had a complete, Russia and the US at the time had a complete mutually assured destruction with our ICBMs, that we create the equivalent of that, that meteorite hitting Earth and, and, and have a nuclear winter. We've since realized that we could come close to that uh, with global climate change having horrendous effects. I didn't know it at the time uh, when uh, fishermen in Forked River, New Jersey in the late 70s, early 80s called us up and said, can you help us? We're losing a piling a week down here at the marina. And Ruth Turner, my boss at Harvard, was the world's expert on teritos, these little shipworms that are really a relative of a clam that eat wood. They're like termites of the sea. Um, so we came down. Clearly, they were losing a lot of pilings. This in the middle of winter, no storms, no ice. And so we took samples. Brought them back to the Museum of Natural History and started to look at them. Yeah, they were riddled. But they were alive and active in the middle of winter. And they were from Puerto Rico, as I remember. So what in heaven's Cain's name a Puerto Rican Toritos doing in Forked River, New Jersey, in the middle of winter, not only living but reproducing and eating pilings like nothing. Normally, our Toritos up here shut down November, December, January, February, March, April. So they don't do the much damage as they do in the Caribbean when they eat all the wood. So we found out, geez, the water temperature is in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Why? Forked River nuclear power plant. So 40 years ago, we saw what potential effects of global warming could be, but the term didn't exist. And we, we thought, well, this is anomaly. This is strange. This is a one-off. Well, it wasn't. Jacques Cousteau at the time said, if we ever built the number of nuclear power plants, plants that are planting, would sterilize the oceans because he helped to figure out that a power plant all but cooks the proteins and the plankton that go through the plant. And then I, in a later project, helped to stop Pilgrim 2 by studying the effects of the warm gases, being a scuba diver, I know this stuff, people said that too, all that stuff, Charles and Will's gas law, that as you warm up water, the gases come out of solution faster, and guess what? We had clams getting the bends in their hinges. <laughs> now that's not exactly a career. I'm studying snail teeth as I did in high school and college. I'm an expert in radula for what that matters, the teeth of snails. Not going to get me more than a cup of coffee and a beer at Bill's house and, and a paragraph on one of his books. So, whoa, what the hell's going on here? So people started to link several of these things together and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are starting to have widespread effects on the oceans. And we didn't mean to. We didn't know that we were. And so that's a long, long-winded answer to the, what your question was, well, what the heck is going on in the permafrost, and what will happen if all that methane comes out? Something probably very bad, because that will be in a big scale. So here, you know, I was looking at Pilgrim, causing hinge bends, hinge bends in the clams, and we were looking at Forked River, New Jersey, with warm water allowing Puerto Rican Toritos, termites of the sea, to live. But we didn't realize how big a problem we were looking at, because we were looking through Alice's little you know, looking glass backwards. And so now, we realize we done more well better extrapolate data. We're not exaggerating. We're realizing, boy, this could get worse quicker than we thought it could. So that's where your question is taking us here. How bad could it get? How quickly? We're not sure, but it could. The fact that we're seeing so much ice breaking off now has the Atlantic Ice Patrol very worried. When were they created? After the sinking of the Titanic. When was that? 1912? How many hundreds of lives have been lost in ship collisions with ice since then? 
Not many. Why? Because of the ice patrol, which also depends on satellites to tell them where to go to look for ice and to warn vessels to you know, slow down, go around. So it's interesting. We need, we need thousands of more people. They're coming. You look at Woods Hole and our joint uh, PhD program with MIT. Uh, 40 years ago, we had one graduate. And so we had a board of directors meeting that week so we could all attend graduation with her parents. She said, thank you for coming. Now we graduate dozens and dozens every year of bright young people. And I see with the programs that Bill and I helped start with Earthwatch, and that I do with the Massachusetts Envirothon. Anybody know about the Envirothon? We need all the help we can get. We work with hundreds of high school kids in the state, and there's National Envirothon in almost every state, where we have dozens of high school kids working on projects during the year, and then they come together. This year, I think it's May 18th at Drumlin Farm, to present what they've learned and engage in, in projects. And I'm both a judge and an advisor, and I'm on the council helping to figure out how we're going to do what we're going to do. Uh, we need funding, we need judges, we need assistance, we need help. Massachusetts and Firethon, Google it. It's a great organization. Most people know about it. I keep saying we're our own worst enemy. We've got to be on the podcast. We've got to be on cable TV. We need the newspapers. Every time the newspaper comes, something happens, we don't make the newspaper. Uh, and so, but it's a wonderful, we had a group from Monson, Mass. You know Monson, Mass? What happened to Monson? Tornado. They got wiped out. So these kids, it's largely farming community, they did their little project and they were, they were reporting and afterwards we had some time they said, well, what else did you kids do with your project? And we'd already filled out the judging forms and they said, well, we created a seed library. So when people went to the library to get books and newspapers, they could take seeds out too. The judge and I looked at each other, give us those forms back. And uh, afterwards I said, God, I wish I could just have 10 or 15 minutes with these kids, you know, before they, so she says, the heck with that, give me five. And uh, so we need people to help advise these kids, to counsel these kids, and we need judges at the Envirothon uh, Day. Uh, so Google Mass Envirothon, if you can donate, donate. If you can donate your time, that's even better. Uh, both, I should be saying equal. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's lots and lots of neat things going on, and, and, and these kids are interested, and they need our assistance to help give them a push you know, Paul Milan. That's why I'm involved as much as I'm retiring from administration in the fall so I can do more time doing things like this and working on things like the Envirothon and working with groups uh, of, of young people that want to do things, you know, out there in the environment. Yes? Uh, I'm worried about the burning of the gas in our automobiles and uh, gas engines. Yep. You know, about 10 years ago, Mass... Uh, the Merrimack College chemistry professor wrote an article and it was in the Globe. And she showed in her article about what, when you burn one gallon of gas, you produce a thousand gallons of CO2. Yes. So I called her up to talk with her because I did a real science teacher and I thought I knew something. I was on to something and she said, you know what? I never got one response. So here I am. I'm thinking. Every gallon of gas, now of course depends on the octane. Yep, yep. Lots of variables. Generically, just like I was doing in some of my slides. But one gallon of gas we burn produces a thousand gallons of CO2. Yeah. And that can't be good. No. But we also worry about if we go to all these batteries. As we speak, there are more copper mines than ever being dug. And they're surface mines. They're not below surface like coal. There are more lithium mines being dug than ever before because we need the lithium and we need the copper for the batteries. So beyond the worry of lithium batteries going on fire, we need a better battery. We need it right now. We need Jeff Bezos and we, we need, we need you know, all these guys, Elon Musk, uh, all to come together with Bloomberg and Gates and say, OK, we're going to get a better battery. Even better, can we jump the ship and the shark here and go to what? Hydrogen. Who killed the electric car the first time? Jim. I've served on UMTA, Urban Mass Transportation Authority, for 10 long years, hundreds of hours of meetings. Mass Metropolitan Area Planning Council. We were extending the red line from Harvard Square all the way up. It was going to go up to Route 2. 
pass through Arlington. One thing that Somerville, Cambridge, Belmont, Arlington, Medford agreed on, it can't land at our life. We didn't end our life. Because some of the people in Arlington decided, we don't want that here. It might turn us into Harvard Square. Meanwhile, if you've been to Porter Square, Davis Square lately, it used to be drive-by shootings now, so Fresco drive-by dining. Property values tripled. But we had the state's first electric car charging stations in that. We were so advanced. We had 10 of them, never used, because there was no electric car to use them. <laughs> now we have real ones and electric cars do use them. So I've been involved in my life in a lot of projects that went nowhere, and we met well, and we knew we, we had, you know. So yeah, things don't always work, but you pick yourself up, dust yourself up, and go to the next thing. So yes, we've got to, we've got to jump the ship on the gasoline engine. We're doing well. We've, we've doubled mileage in, in what, 10 years that we get out of these things. What we haven't doubled is the mileage that we get from boats. Almost everything in our community, 90% came on a boat from somewhere else, burning bunker oil. Our biggest ships now carry 14,000 TEUs. What is a TEU? Trailer equivalent unit, 20-foot trailer. 14,000. And there's hundreds of those every day. So we've got to back off how much it ship, where it can ship, and what's the best way to ship anything on Earth right now? Rail. And what are we doing with rail? We're destroying it. You can't get rail through Chicago. We've got two places between Boston and Florida where there is one track, where there is one bridge. So whoever's in charge, we need better ties, better rails, better ballast. Are those sexy things? No. We've got the locomotives. GE has some great locomotives. Um, but we've, we've got to improve the, the basic infrastructure. We just call it public works, didn't we? Infrastructure. So with that, I'll take one more question, because I was told we've got to be out of here at a certain hour. Oh, yes, but we can't live there. That's a great question. Carl Sagan will be doing handstands, jumping jacks for you live. We call those things extremophiles. There are things that live in high acid environments, high CO2 environments, low oxygen environments. Um, but they're on Europa. They're in the, the acid pools in Yellowstone. They're in the deep sea, down where were we at deep, where were we? 10,000 feet, 3,000 meters um, next to the deep sea vents with hydrogen sulfide coming out, and there's bacteria that love that. And there's a whole ecosystem that would die if it was in sunlight, but it depends on the dark, and it depends on sulfur. That same pollutant we were talking, coming out here, uh, they, they depend on sulfur as the beginning of chemosynthesis, where sulfur-reducing bacteria live on that, that sulfur, and then other things live on them, filtering in those bacteria. So the answer is yes, yes, and yes, but not here for us other places. I want to thank you all. Uh, you've got my email. Think of coming to one of those events. Tuesday night is going to be a heck of a lot of fun. And I get to pick. Okay, who do I pick? I'm going to pick.